It's Wizards vs. Lesbians, a podcast for your ears. Hello and welcome to Wizards vs. Lesbians. My name is Isaac. I'm Alexis. And today we are talking about These Burning Stars by Bethany Jacobs. Would you like to do the plot or shall I? I will try. Um, in a far off space empire, uh, Essek, a sociopathic cleric, is um, trying to track down something that has great, that could uh, make her family, uh, could link her family to a recent genocide of some space Jews. Um, and Essek has been assigned to this task and it, but is mostly obsessed with tracking down six a renegade assassin trainee uh who she has a deep bizarre obsession with um and we get we follow uh chono one of her former proteges who's trying to be a good person and mostly failing um uh, and a uh lesbian hacker in um uh in hiding sort of um on the run who also has history with essek um as and as we go as we switch from the past to the present and see how everybody has these complicated relationships with essek and how essek has destroyed all of their lives yes um i will i will totally accept that uh are there <laughs> lesbians in this book yes one of the viewpoint characters june is a lesbian 100 percent. are there wizards I mean, Essek is kind of a wizard, and Six is absolutely a wizard. Six is a is a total wizard. Yeah, no, I think there's there there are definitely wizards in this book as well, um, and they are everybody here is in conflict with each other in different combinations, right. which change over the course of the book. Um, why should you read this one? Well, I I know you didn't, but I enjoyed it. Um, I thought you know af- after the first bit, which was it's after a slow start. Um, I found it a, you know, cut. there was always something happening and there were interesting character dynamics um, and there were space Jews, which I absolutely have a weakness for. They're not called Jews, but they're very obviously Jews. <laughs> Analog, Jew, uh, metaphorical Jews, but still. Um, yeah, I, I, I don't know. I, I mean, I, I, what I said to you was that I found this book extremely frustrating Mm. And the reason that I found it extremely frustrating was because there's a really good book in here. Um, and it is surrounded with a lot of cruft. Uh, <laughs> mm. And uh, I found, I think the central psychodrama between Essex and Six is fantastic. Um, and the rest of it is ranges from boring to actively terrible. Um, <laughs> I, again, I don't actually agree though. I, I mean, I agree with you that the I, I definitely agree with you that there's a lot of craft here that could have been trimmed down. Um, the book is longer than it needs to be. But I also found I mean, I found the SX6 Chono three way psychodrama to be pretty interesting, actually. Yeah, no, it's it's by far the best part of the book. And for, the, we're, I'm in the weird position of saying that this book would have been better if they'd cut the plot with the lesbians. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm, I am a hundred percent with you. Um, and unfortunately, like, yeah, no, the lesbians are the least interesting part of this book, uh, which is a real shame, but, um, yeah, no, I think that, I think I pretty much covered why you should and why you shouldn't from my standpoint. Um, I think that like, there's a, it's a real good sort of like almost film noir sort of story that happens between Essex and Six. It's like, you know, there's some like it's really interesting to see how sort of the sort of Freudian weird sort of uh, jealousy obsession stuff that you got in like classic Hollywood movies um, mm-hmm. plays out in a culture with uh, like 2020s gender politics about and like, you know, sort of advanced pick your own gender sort of uh, politics. That's really interesting. Yeah. And I mean, I, I do think also that. um I, I enjoyed Essek just as a character because she's I she's somebody who is awful and knows she's awful and this doesn't bother her at all. And it's actually good sometimes to have villains be like, yep, yeah, I know I'm be I'm awful. I just don't care about you enough to not be awful. Yeah, and like you get to see her, you know, 
you you understand why she's she's charismatic and like compelling enough that you get to see why the characters who should know better you know care about her yeah exactly so and for me that was really what sold me on the book um and the you know and again i unfortunately they probably should have cut the entire subplot with the lesbians another reason why you shouldn't read this the beginning is kind of slow and messy um and also there's so much like this ha- absolutely has the aesthetics of a 90s epic fantasy with like absolute with like weird replacements for relatively for like nouns that we absolutely have in english and mm. Um, random bits of conleg sprinkled throughout and apostrophes where there absolutely do not need to be apostrophes. Um, uh, thankfully, the audiobook spared me that. Uh, content warnings. Um, murder, torture. So much murder. <laughs> so much murder. Murder via torture. Uh, genocide. Genocide. Um, and this this one is perhaps going to be uh, a, a point of contention which, uh, between us, but weird philosemitism. Oh no, there's absolutely some weird, like, look, I, I have a soft spot for anything that has metaphorical Jews in it. Um, and I, I very much enjoyed the metaphorical Jews here, but there's some weird stuff going on with them. Um, <laughs> Good. I'm, glad that, I'm glad that that's sort of our baseline from which we can receive, because I was like, oh, this is giving me all sorts of weird, like, creep vibes around the way that th- this book is handling the they're the Jews. And by the way, you know, if, if unless you think that we're doing, that we're being needlessly one-to-one, they literally are called Giovanni, which is like Jews plus Rom- Romani. And they live on Jeve and they mine Jevite. They're Jews. <laughs> also, I mean. <laughs> they are, I mean, they, they are entirely defined by they worship the wrong God. They were, they have a religion that is related to the dominant religion but is different in how they worship the their one god um and they um they are mostly you know so they're defined by that the fact that they were heavily persecuted before being the survivors of a horrible genocide within living memory and yep. these days are mostly known for having trade unions mm-hmm. and they are have a massive uh, secret conspiracy and hidden wealth uh that even all members of their own uh, society aren't aware of. Yes. Again, <laughs> not saying it's an unproblematic uh, depiction <laughs> of space Jews, but I nonetheless enjoyed them. Um, Fair enough. <laughs> this book features space Jews, Jews from outer space. They're perfect and unselfish and unfathomably based. Space Jews, Jews from outer space. Jews from outer space. All right. Uh, so I think I think that being said, um, shall we? Uh, let's see here. Oh, child abuse also. Oh, so physical much physical and sexual. Yes. Uh, it's. Uh, I, I it's think a, it's, this it is a it tough is old universe. Well. That this book is. I, I yes, do think. I would agree. I, I think there's a there's a fair amount of um, sexual exploitation of both minors and adults. I think by and large it is handled well. Um, I agree. I agree. It is not flinched away from, and it is also shown to be something that you know has long lasting, um, you know, can shape the way that one views the world. Yeah, no, I, um, actually it's both handled well and badly in the same book, I think. Mm. Um, but it's, which again, goes back to how very frustrating a reading experience for me was because it's like the author demonstrates themselves to be capable of doing some really good stuff. And then when the clumsy stuff happens, I'm like, what the fuck is, are you doing? But anyway, let's uh, let's go to the spoiler zone and talk about that. Let's. <laughs> spoiler zone. All right, here we are in the spoiler zone. So let's start with the giant twist. That, actually, before we start with the twist, I want to ask you, cause did the audiobook have the, you know, um, the cast the li- the cast list? Did it start off with the cast list? No. Oh, that's you're super missing out. The uh, the cast list in this case actually is sort of is an interesting way of setting things up because you're first of all there's maps, which again, I almost wonder if this was written as an epic fantasy. And then was like rewritten to be a space opera given like the conditions of the zeitgeist, um, because 
it starts with maps, and maps don't really work in a multiple solar system planetary thing. And yet, there are maps. Um, but anyway, you get to the also, you know, it's like a cleric, a cleric, the first cleric, a secretary, a cleric, murdered. Um, the Nightfoot matriarch, you know, June Ironway, a caster. And then, you know, it gets to also Lucas Alanye, a genocider. And then, you know, a pirate, a pirate captain, an archivist, and six. Yeah, no, that's good. Right, that like that that was actually um, that was what intrigued me enough to get through the initial like the first two chapters, um, which are a mess. I don't know. I don't know. I actually found the 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 very first the very first chapter. No, the, I like the very first chapter. Yeah. Um, but I don't know. It just I felt like it kind of stumbled. Part of part of it is just that I saw all the apostrophes and was like, I don't know if I have. <laughs> and the fact that they use san s a a n um, to mean you know, person, um, and uh, and the fact that they refer to their assassins as cloaks. So, you know, you have cloak son, which is absolutely a sort of mid-90s fantasy affectation. Oh, I just thought it was Z-O-N, and I might have uh, I might have respected that more, to be honest. Oh, no, see, that would have been a great choice. That totally would have been a much better space opera aesthetic choice. Um, <laughs> yeah. So this is so this is actually an area where it works, where you get a better experience from the audiobook, even if you do miss out on the cast list. Indeed. Um, so, but yeah, let's talk about the twist. So despite the fact that, as we have noted, the author is not um, subtle uh, <laughs> in their naming of things. Um, <laughs> Witness, for example, that Essex is kind of six in pig Latin, kind of, you know, <laughs> it's sort of the same kind of like, um, but I still didn't see the twist coming. And it was also a, uh, and it also is one of those twists where you go back and think about it and it's like, oh, that explains a bunch of stuff. Right. Actually, I actually went back when I've been rereading this for the podcast. I was, one of the things I was really looking for is, was the twist properly foreshadowed? And it really is, including, totally is. including actually, I was like, oh, this is why people's blood types keeps coming up in the book. Yes, it's not just part of the whole like weird philosemitism bit. Um, <laughs> and uh, but uh, but yeah, no. And, and I was like, man, um, it's weird to me that I'm finding like like historical Essex more compelling than now Essex. And it's like <laughs> now Essex seems to be like just talking like a supervillain monologue and like previous Essex was kind of more dynamic and interesting with it. And it was like, right. holy shit, that was on purpose. Right. Um, and that's like a real neat nifty distinction to be able to pull off in your writing. So like massive kudos to the author for managing to get that across. Yes. And it, and for me, at least it really held up on the reread. Cause you know, then all of those times where people are surprised by Essex, by how, you know, quote unquote, Essek um, is behaving in the present day. It's like, oh, of course, you know, of course, Essek, you know, of course, Six disguising themselves as Essek is not going to be bringing her like stable of protégés along on these missions. Um, Absolutely. Um, so in case you're you've missed the the meat of what we're saying here, uh, as it, so the 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 sort of the 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 capsule plot summary is that Essex goes to the school where Six is like this like the head of the class you know massively gifted student and like the master has brought Essex there to try to impress her which is a really stupid idea and he gets his for that um, yes. because Essex kills anybody who who gets her attention in a way that she doesn't like um, yep but uh so es Essex capriciously decides, ooh, this, you know what? I'm going to fuck with this child. Um, Essek has a real, uh, despite not actually giving birth to anybody, Essek has a real, you know, shot at worst mom. Um, yeah. Just be, just because of the sheer tiny space which she crams her terrible mothering into, like over the course of like 10 minutes, she fucks this child up for life, which is really <laughs> interesting as a move. Yes, um, and then later adopts one of the other children in this group of six. Yes. And does her best to fuck them up too. Exactly. Um, but anyway, she managed, she basically destroys Six's uh, hopes and dreams, this gifted kid's hopes and dreams, um, destroys her entire life path, and then says, says, their entire okay, life path. Their life, sorry, yes, their <laughs> entire life path. Um, we don't know what uh, gender this uh, kid was born as because that's not really a thing in this society. Except for Essex family who are TERFs. Yes, which is funny. Yes. <laughs> um, and Essek, you know, the bit during their final confrontation where Essek brings up her vagina is, uh, right? is 
is really funny in that respect. And it's like, girl, she, the, Six had surgery to change the entire shape of her body and to, or their body and to make them taller. Do you think they couldn't handle some genitals? Right, um, exactly. <laughs> um, we can do genitals now. We can't do the rest of those things. <laughs> But uh, regardless, basically Essex makes six into this per- into this like um, entity who is so obsessed with uh, Essex that uh, they end up uh, having plastic surgery after a um, botched uh, attempt to kill them, uh, which makes them into Essex double um, in every respect. And basically six becomes Essex, which... You know, it made it made me think of Perfect Blue. It made me think of like um, all of these sort of classic Hollywood movies about stalking and you know, right. replacing Ex- somebody and wearing right. their face. Yes, exactly. Except that in this case, the one who is stalking, replacing somebody, and wearing their face is actually the less sociopathic of the two. Yes, is actually the hero, which is super interesting. And right. it also, and also, like all of the, there are a couple of narratives that I can think of where it's. Um, where it's a quote unquote man who is who you know is trying to become the starlet or the the focus of the obsession, like um, a woman called Fujiko Mine. If um, if you ever see that, it's a fascinating piece by a, a female director, which is rare in anime, which is also like super transphobic. <laughs> um, but the sort of the the cunning the the gendered aspect of it out. The bottom, but still insisting that it's important that Essek is a woman um, is fascinating. Right. I think is because it's important to Essek and her family. It's not important right. to basically anybody else. Um, so we're ta- we sort of take the transness out of that, um, out of that sort of story where transness has always been kind of a part of it implicitly, and we switch the hero and the villain around. Um, and uh, but we end up with something that is just as bitter and twisted, um, right. just in a, in a different kind of a way, and it's great. Yes, I love that. I wish this book had just been that. <laughs> <laughs> and again, I want to say I think that Chono actually makes a useful uh, character. Oh no, Chono's absolutely a part of it. We couldn't. Yes. You couldn't have. You couldn't do it without Chono. It's 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 just the lesbians that are the problem, unfortunately. Right, unfortunately, yeah, because like. Um, because Chono, you know, humanizes Six. Um, yes. and, and Essek. And Essek, sort of. But the, the thing is that Chono is desperately trying to humanize Essek because Essek, you know, rescued Chono from a sexually exploitive situation when she was, like, 14, I think. Um, mm-hmm. So, and, you know, and it's really obvious, even by the time this happens, which is only, like, chapter two or something, um, chapter three. It's it's really early in the book, but even by then, it's pretty clear that Essek doesn't do this out of any sort of righteousness. It's a combination of she's bored. She, it she, doing so allows her to be cruel to somebody else and you know make money for her family, and also she just finds it aesthetically displeasing. Essek also has that. Um, uh, there is a potential when you have a character like Essek who is so who is so central mm-hmm. um, in a story like this where. The fact that she's a huge badass who doesn't respect anybody um, makes her cool, um, and like this is this to me is the is the Christopher Nolan problem with like the Joker in uh, in the Dark Knight, where it's like I don't care what point you think you're trying to make, but the point that you're actually making is that the Joker is cool and you should blow things up, um, <laughs> because he's the only character who's, in, who's interesting. But this book avoids that through several mechanisms, um, both through sort of the problem, you know, making sort of six as Essek into a more complex character, mm-hmm. uh, and by making like, by letting us sort of go through that process of disillusionment, but loyalty, but faith, but, um, skepticism that Chono does with Essek. Right. Which is, really effective and also by making six even more of a cool mysterious badass which is right you know, which helps um yeah you know, it and, definitely helps and, and six is you know, even more of a cool mysterious badass and is you know and is also doing a lot of uh not very moral things because every you know they're locked in this psychological war with uh with essek but they you know you can see the, the ways that they're like trying to minimize their body count and trying to uh you know 
stop quite so many children from getting caught up in the crossfire and things like that. Um, which, and you know, I like, but the thing is, I like the fact that the end of the book calls them on that, by which I mean Chono. <laughs> um, yes, definitely. It's like, no, actually, we don't get a happy ending because even though we think we've been in the right the entire time, we've both been a uh, party to straight up war crimes constantly. Yeah. I would, that would have been a great scene if they weren't also at that point being lectured by the 21 year old um, space Jew leader. Yes. Um, of spotless moral character. Um, yes. So, <laughs> um, but yes, no, I'm glad that, I'm glad that, you know, the, the, like there, the Chono SX6 arc is great all the way through. It just takes place in this story that has all this other stuff going on in it. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> so let's let's complain about the space Jews some. They're Jews out in space, and once again they're unfathomably based. They're Jews out in space. Why can't we just be like any other race? Because again, you know, um, I had mixed feelings about them. I I enjoyed that they were there, um, and I enjoyed that. Uh, and like, actually, the most the thing I enjoyed most, I guess, unsurprisingly, is Six's relationship to, uh, you know, finding out that they're one quarter space Jew or whatever, uh, mm -hmm. where they really like it, right? Like they get really into this part of their heritage because they think that being descended from genocide victims in like in some ways sort of affirming their sense of, oh, I'm not just de descended from the guy who did the genocide. Yes, and it also sort of gives them a moral, uh, um, something to push against morally that isn't just vengeance against Essek, um, which uh, hilariously lets them do even worse things in pursuit of their goal because they think they have this, you know, um, larger mission, uh, which I think is actually really well observed. <laughs> yes, and I, I did actually like um, the, that... Um, you know, the part of the Javeni plot that I liked was that Six is like, all right, I've consolidated, you know, this entire, ex you know, mining empire, and I plan to hand it over to you, my ancestral people. And they're like, we don't want this. We can't use this. Yes. Legally or logistically. We, we're we just trying to go very far away. And this <laughs> leaves Six just completely baffled on what on earth they're going to do with their life. Um, that and all, the uh, the fact that because so much of the book is about these various MacGuffins around the genocide of these people. And whenever the people are involved, they completely don't care. I mean, they're like, yes, we already knew that this family who we, you know, mostly work in the mine in the factories for was complicit in the genocide. Like, yeah, obviously and the, and the, we're not and the thing stupid. About it is, and the thing about it is that Essex doesn't care either because Right. One of the one of the true things that Essex says is that no, nobody actually cares about this. I mean, in when there's this much money on the table, like you know, real politic is going to trump any sort of sense of performative guilt that this culture has. But I mean, and we're living in a fascist state, so why do you think this is of any importance to us? Right, and you know, it's it's really clear that the performative guilt is useful. But it's mostly useful because it aligns with economic interests. Yes. No, the it is it is naive in a way that it makes sense for Six to be naive to think that this is important in that way. Right. Um, and it's also naive in a way that is makes sense for Six to be, be naive to think that like this society would, you know, honor the <laughs> the system of bureaucratic deals that they made to turn this mining organ thing over into the Giovanni's hands. Uh, so, so those are yeah, the things no. that I like about the space Jews. Now, why don't you complain about all the ways in which it is creepily philosemitic? I mean, there's no, what, what do I even have to say <laughs> about it? They're like, they're like, they're cartoonishly pure and good. You yes. Know? They're despite also being the center of a, you know, like three generations long secret conspiracy. Yes. You know, they have, they managed to keep, this, you know, massive amount of wealth and, and like, uh, and, and resources hidden from the rest of the world. Um, they, uh, 
I mean, you say, yes, we have no use for, they say we have no use for the Jevite, I mean, the, the Sevite trade. Um, but that's also like, that decision is made on behalf of an entire nation of people by um, a their their leadership who, first of all, all of the people aren't even aware that there is a leadership. I don't know how those leaders are put into place. Um, also, they're so incorruptible that they resign even at the first whiff of corruption and throw their <laughs> lives away in the pursuit of, you know, of, of their, their goals. You know, you, you do have to imagine that um, this is not... A very this is not going to be a functional government it make it makes you wonder if this actually was how the government was run or if this is just an ideal that you know they've like idealized their government of the past and so now you know now that their government isn't actually you know allowed to formally exist and thus isn't nearly as accountable um yes. suddenly they are behind all of these fantastic ideals and I would love to know how, like, how many of these these ships know, even know that they have this government, and like, how many of them are like, why are we at Space Alaska? Right. What happened? <laughs> you know, why are we why are we colonizing this completely uninhabited planet <laughs> um, where there is no problem about the people who are already there? You know, which is the this is the same problem. This is the same problem that. Um... Uh, unconquerable son had of how do you deal with your you know with having your space though that had real Jews um, in space but you know how do you deal with your diasporic oppressed people um, and, and you know and in this one it's give them their own homeland where they will not be colonizing anybody else and can be a new homeland because you know they cannot return to their old one um, versus unconquerable son which said oh they just are really into living living in their spaceships now yeah yeah no we're we're, we're permanently uh that's sort of the romany kind of future f science fiction romany sort of a way to deal it um and uh also oh my one of my favorite bits is that when the space jews send out the space massad it's just to find other space jews and to bring them into the fold because you know we want everybody to come home and even a single missing jew is not acceptable and we're not going to, like, exclude massive amounts of people who identify as Jews for various technical reasons <laughs> or anything <laughs> like that. No, yes. even... <laughs> Honestly, this very much does feel like it comes out of, like, a, you know, 70s, 80s idea of Israel. Yeah, it's like when, when, we were, when Israel was still commun <laughs> communist, in quotes. Uh, well, it was, you know, it was still doing a lot more airlifts and things like that um, right. instead of, well, well, okay, we're not getting into the rest of that. Um, yeah, no, I mean, that, this is exactly the conversation that I was, that I don't want this episode right. to turn into. So let's, point. okay. So, uh, so I, I, I feel that. like, I feel like we've <laughs> talked about, you know, the strengths and weaknesses of the space Jewish plot. Um, I did think, you know, I did actually think that um, Chono's decision in the end was very much in keeping with Jewish values of, no, actually you can't just, Get your happy ending you have to go and do some teshuva uh yes which is weird because she's not a space jew no she's not at all but, she's you know, a space christian in fact <laughs> she is very much is yeah she's very much the like um which is what made me think is the philosemitism it's like really the you know the person who really has the 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 suffering and the and the you know values that she holds on to despite all of this temptation and strife is the space christian yes who, you know, who inspires people with her beautiful prayers and singing. Um, yeah. Anyway. Yeah. No, that is a, that is a valid point. This does very much um, read like, uh, you know, creepy, philosemitic. Um, so yes. yeah, nope. I, I, I completely giving on that one. Um, <laughs> I nonetheless enjoyed the book, but um, no, I mean, that, largely, yes. There's some really good stuff in here. There's some really some good really stuff in here. And some really frustrating stuff. Yes. I mean, like, part of it, you And know, some really boring stuff, if you want to move on to our, uh, well, I, I was our, our first, lesbians. Yes, but first I would just like to say that I would like to see this book get some fandom on Tumblr, because I feel like, you know, Essek could be such a good Tumblr sexy woman. Why is it always sexy men? Why not sexy women? Ianthe can't hold down the fort all by herself. Why is it always sexy men? Why not sexy women? The AFAB wet cats and the she her blorbos and the 
Femme scrunkle scrumblies, scrunkles. Yeah, no, I right? completely I, agree. I, I There's want, a lot there. I want to see people try to woobify Essek. I love that she just, she's frustrated. So she's just like creepily fucked her subordinate. And then when, because she's has a, she just murders him afterwards because she's like, <laughs> not, no, not her subordinate, right? This is an important, this is a key thing where Chono spends, you know, like this appears to be Chono's one uncrossable line is, right. yes, well, um, Essek, you know, murders people whenever she's bored and is locked in this, um, in, you know, uh, in this psychological war with an increasingly high casualty rate um, and straight up murders people. And yes, which I think I already said, but you know, like Essex doesn't never does anything good unless it's out of either boredom or financial motivation um, and does bad things all the time uh, or aesthetic, you know, aesthetic preferences usually, but you know, for Chodo or or, more boredom. Yes. Um, but, you know, for Chota, there's this one uncrossable line, but at least she doesn't sleep with her subordinates. And for you, know, that makes sense for Chono, who, you know, was rescued out of a situation where, you know, they were being sexually exploited as a student. Um, that, you know, that this would be their one uncrossable line. But then you look and you're like, really, Chono? That's the only thing? <laughs> yes. He may, she may be a mass murderer, but she doesn't sleep with her students. Right, but she will, you know, sleep with her former students underling. That's fine. Yes. And, and she'll sleep with, you know, the house servants. That's also fine. Yes. Now there's uh, there's plenty of um, there's plenty of double consciousness to go around uh, yes. here. But actually, I, I this also makes me want to highlight, like, um, speaking of politics surrounding Judaism, like. The the sort of the scene where Chono and Essek sort of have where Chono, um, you know, adopts Essek essentially is a really or Essek adopts Chono is a really interesting one because it is like so, so out of the like the fa the fascist strongman goes into this party full of decadent financiers and like humiliates and strikes terror into them and reveals their venality and corruption um and uh and like is so and it's so like you know nice in a sort of a squirmy way to watch her do it mm -hmm. um and we so and like me think me being there being like oh how she scorns these effete socialites there you know <laughs> and shono uh seeing that part of her first essentially right. well second um, Second, after the, uh, the first, the first thing Chono sees is her permanently fucking over Chono's only friend. <laughs> yes, but um, you know, but the sec her second impression is <laughs> is this, and it it does like be and it, again, it gives you that sort of like, oh, okay, I can see why, I can see where Chono is coming from, right, and like um, why you imprinted on this person, and right, exactly, um, all of the. She she is contemptuous of these people for all the right reasons, even though she herself is a worse monster than any of them. Yes, and even though I mean, you know, because you say these decadent financiers, she then does use the public humiliation of this guy as a way to extort more money out of him, extort like yes, a of better, course. of course, you know, of course. <laughs> a better mining co equipment contract or something. Yeah, no, th this is this is like fascism one hundred and one. Yes, and then force him to sleep with her. Yes. Uh, um, see, I love that part so much. It, um, yeah, no, that's a great scene. Yeah, um, I'm gonna keep. I'm gonna keep going, and you know, because that was my experience of, with this book. I'm gonna keep repeating. Ah! And by that noise, I mean to communicate the feeling of loving and hating something at the same time. You know. Yes. Uh, <laughs> right. And so this is, but you know, see what I mean? Like, I, I feel like, I feel like Essek would just do really well on Tumblr. Uh, I would like to see everybody contort themselves to try to, you know, make excuses for her. I think it would she be actually did nothing wrong. Yeah, right, no. exactly. I mean, these these underlings that you're sleeping with, they are fascist assassins. Yeah. You know, they probably deserve to be killed. <laughs> the fact that she killed one mostly because, you know, first, well, because especially because she wakes up and he's, you know, and her, the assassin, the like junior assassin who she has slept with. I mean, she still kills asleep. him for, for, for napping. Let's well, be real. Sort I mean, of. She's annoyed because she told right. him to get up and he's napping. Right. But also, um, you know, she sees him napping and she's like, 
maybe I should cut off a toe or something. That would teach him a lesson about, you know, always being alert. And then she gets distracted, has this whole experience where, you know, she thinks that she's killed six and she has all these emotions about killing six that she can't process. And so that's when she murders the guy because, you know, he happens to still be in her bed. Yes, this is true. And she partly murders um, the guy so that she doesn't murder Chono. Yeah. Like, Again, like good character stuff. Right. And like her relationship with Chono is really, you know, we've talked about like Chono's relationship with her. Her relationship with Chono is also really interesting because, you know, she like exclusively trains assassins um, and she mostly wants to sort of make them as ruthless and capricious as she is. Uh, and she never succeeds at all with that with Chono, who like remains religious and is, you know, like, no, I'm absolutely going to become a priest. And the fact but like she seems to really enjoy the fact that you know, Chono isn't going she to She tells into her. her to become a priest. Eventually, like, yes. She sends her off to become a priest. Right, but that's like that's right when she's, you know, she's she's sending her off to become a priest because she doesn't want to kill her and she's worried that yes. she's going to. This is after several years of training. And just like throughout the entire thing, sort of the novelty of having somebody who's genuinely religious and, you know, seems to think that there's some moral good in her and in the world. Um, and you know, like Soup is respects her and fears her and yet is willing to draw a single line against her like the novelty of that it keeps her interested for several years absolutely absolutely so again great character work she's she's just she's such a wonderful charismatic sociopath indeed um all right so uh let's move on a little bit um so unfortunately the uh <laughs> The lesbians are the least successful part of the book. Um, part of this is because uh, uh, June um, doesn't really have a personality um, and spends most of her time being like the, you know, the character in the book. And this is a, a, char- a sort of a character archetype that I have very little time for. Who's the one who stands around shouting about how weird everything is and like how everything's going wrong. Um, and like, being the one who is like, you know, no, we're not going to go to next location and do next scene. And then we go to next location and do next scene. Well, sort of. She and her girlfriend take turns being that person. Yes, exactly. Right? And which is, which again, contributes to the idea that June, like the sense that June doesn't have a solid character. She weren't, you know, she starts out being somewhat interesting and in that she's, you know, like, oh, yeah, 100%. She's, like, like, she's like this, you know, cocky hacker who, uh, you know, like has made this name and is really, and really wants this, thing so that she you know this big score and then yeah and then she can't then somehow she and her former assassin girlfriend switch personalities sort of yes this is true um and also like she's not just a hacker she's a super hacker she can do things that literally nobody else on earth can do and we don't know why sorry on taros um we there's doesn't seem to be anything about her particularly that makes her this um, right. She doesn't there's, seem there's to a... have a, any kind of odd personality, or you know, she. I mean, the other like super powerful people who we see are like you know, Six and Essek are like really fucked up, you know, as it is, as one tends to be. And what June has is sort of a case of CTPSD around. Sorry, not CT. CPSD. CP. CPTSD. <laughs> Thank you. Um, around the idea and is triggered by the idea of hiding instead of running. Um, incidentally, maybe I can retroactively add the content warning. Bad way to handle somebody having a CPTSD episode, um, <laughs> restraining and then sedating them. Oh, yes, yes. <laughs> yes, <laughs> but, do not. Uh, uh... Don't do that. No. Though, um... <laughs> so, you know, if they'd been better characterized, that scene could have worked. Because, like, they have a weird kind of fucked up relationship. It's just, it's not well characterized. And so, you know, like, you could totally see how the, how this relationship between the super hacker fugitive and the former assassin fugitive um, could be the kind of thing where they deeply love each other. And yet, when one of them is having a horrible trigger episode, the other one's like, great, gonna sedate you, gonna pump you full of morphine. Like that could have worked if, but the book the book kind of really wants to idealize their relationship. It wants them to be this sort of like perfect lesbian couple. Yeah, which makes me. I mean, you said earlier that you were wondering if like this book started as a fantasy and 
became a space opera because of the zeitgeist. And I, and I thought to myself, did this start being a book that was just about Essex, Chono, and Six and added lesbians because of the zeitgeist? Well, but of course, I, I still wonder if the, I mean, the whole hacking thing, the hackers are called casters. And the way, the one scene we get where June is actually doing her hacking is very much magic. I mean, it just sort of, it works purely on like imagination and metaphor. In the book's defense, it's impossible to make hacking interesting. Visually, it's always going to be either somebody typing on their keyboard or undergoing some kind of immersive three-dimensional AI first-person shooter. The only people who've managed it is the classic 90s movie, Hackers. By the way, if you haven't watched that in a while, there is some gender in that movie. Is it if if June were particularly imaginative, had like a super clear mind's eye, that could explain why she's such a good hacker. But you're right, there's absolutely no reason why she's supposed to be legendary, and she doesn't have, and she doesn't really even sell the personality of being this legendary black market hacker. I mean, we see what a like the personality of a, of a person who's a like weird spends all their time in the internet hacker is like with the uh with the concierge at the at the sort of the hackers they're a great hotel. little weird character yeah like if june had been that um, yes i would have bought it you yes know? um but no june is our point of view relatable every woman character somehow yeah honestly i think it would have worked up you know this is very much oh well why did the author write the book i want instead but um i would have liked to see it I think it would have worked better from Lisa's point of view, who she's a more interesting character to start with anyway, the, you know, assassin who at some point unbrainwashed herself and ran. Um, Mm -hmm. And then you could have let June be really weird. Yeah. Um, So, like, I think my, I was sort of, like, rolling with it for a while, Um, the the whole June and Lisa thing. I was like, Mm -hmm. okay, I'm finding... This part's, you know, I was really enjoying the book through the first half. And mm-hmm. then, like, I was like, okay, the scenes with June and Lisa are dragging. June started off being a sort of a more interesting character with more, like, you know, she's, you know, having this weird, this kind of cool, tense psychological standoff with this pirate captain. That's interesting. Um, and then it started to drift a little bit. And I think the point where I really lost patience, both with that and the book, was the part was... Um, and you know, I'd been losing patience, but was the scene that was happening on the, on the, uh, the world ship, the, the colony ship, mm-hmm. you know, philosemitism aside, I don't appreciate that you're having crowds of Jews running from a terrorist attack as scene setting. Yeah. I don't fair. appreciate that you're, that that's the, these screaming people are in the background and we're caring about this non-character and her, you know, and her angst about her girlfriend in this moment when you're using these people who you've set up as being like, you know, incredibly traumatized people who've been through a genocide and you've just, you know, you're unleashing this on them and they're just in the background. Plus they, and plus they did totally fridge Niccolo. Um, they you did, know, yes. They, he shows up, gets to be this like fun, charming, cool gentleman thief type, but, you know, secretly working for the greater good type character. And then, you know... Before you even, like, get to have any fun reading him, he gets brutally murdered for being, To save know. this person who is t- special because we're told she's special. Yeah. We haven't seen any reason why she's special. We're just told she is. All right. Well, you've successfully convinced me that actually this book is anti-Semitic. Um. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. No, no, no. I mean, Honestly, it really is, though. No, uh, you're right. Honestly, you're right. Um, I was sufficiently charmed by the by our Chono SX-6 drama that I was willing to overlook a lot of stuff, but nope, I, I, you're right. Um. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well. Oh, well. Um. I'm still going to read the sequel. Um. Yeah, no, I, do, do tell me how it is, because I'm not. Yes. Um. Um, I did, I like uh, the, the only thing I know about the sequel is that, because uh, there's a sample chapter of the sequel in the um, non-audio book, and it's, it's a flashback. It's the same day that Essek um, adopts Chono, and it is Six finding one of the people who uh, Chono was forced to have sex with, bragging about it, and then Six brutally murdering them in an alley. Um, so, you know. I mean, we have fun. Right, fun. exactly. <laughs> Why not? I'm just hoping that it has, you know, if it, if it has more 
hopefully it won't have June at least because they'll be off in like space Alaska where, you know, um, uh, as we know is where you send the Jews when you don't have anywhere else to put them. Um, <laughs> yes, no, I'll, I'll do a little uh, jingle ha- ask, saying people should read uh, the, um, Oh my god, what the fuck is that book? Despite the fact that I couldn't remember what the Yiddish Policeman's Union was called, it's one of my favorite books and you should read it. It's much more interesting than Michael Chabon's other books, which is a great book. It is a great uh, book. About, about Jews in Alaska. Yes. Um, but uh, the um, I will say, actually, in this book's defense, um, one thing that I did very much like about the way that it handled that whole thing politically is that um, the the culture tried to spin the genocide of the Giovanni as if it was the doing of one guy. Yes, right? that was well handled. And of, and it becomes apparent that of course it wasn't because it never is. It's not like you kill Hitler and there's no Holocaust. Right. Um, you know the this is a genocide is not something that a single person can do. It's an entire nation being either overtly or, you know, or uh, covertly complicit in the action of a bureaucracy of murder. And uh, that is what it, it turns out to be in this case. And they've pinned it on this one schmuck who was a kind of a dumb, shitty person, but was not the thing that they made him out to be. Or he kind of, well, he sort of was, but, you know. He was the trigger man. Right. Um, but, but that's not the same thing. Right, you know? exactly. And also, you know, we don't live in a, well... We don't live in a world besides like, you know, rogue nuclear actors where that kind of destruction can be done by a single individual. So, yeah. And um, right. Like that, that part I thought was well handled. And then again, the idea that, you know, oh, well, but these people are responsible for this genocide. And the response being, it's not like this was the first one. Yes. (laughs) No, I mean, yeah. I mean, this is how this is how states maintain their power. Um, unfortunately. And, uh, it's the narratives that are created around them that are, uh, again, that are written by the victors as a general matter. Mm -hmm. Uh, but, uh, yeah, but, but lest we get into more depressing (laughs) stuff, um, um, (laughs) do you have any other, uh, notes about this book? Um, um, have my having convinced you that it's <laughs> yes, well done there it was a very convincing case um, uh, so I think um, the time jumps actually worked well um, absolutely I agree. You know, and in general the construction especially if you pull out again you could actually pull out basically all of the scenes with um, you know all of the scenes with June um, and just remove them and it wouldn't really affect the plot or yep. and you know, you could just have them happen and not get June's point of view and it would have worked really well. Um so um Yeah. And I I mean I would have or or you could have made June into a real character. Like you could yes. have explored because this book this author is clearly capable of exploring how f- fucked up and weird, you know, raising children to be child soldiers is. Like you could have gotten into how weird it was that her grandpa chose to do this to their family. Um, right. And like how weird it is that she's so unproblematically unprob- like, you know, happy that he did this and, you know, respects him so much. Right. Well, and, you know, and how weird and like also, again, reasons why June should have been, been more interestingly fucked up. What is it like to be the sort of kid who goes off to your fancy academy um, with a you know, with the not with like instructions on how to find the safe house, because clearly that's going to come up. Right. And like, where's your survivor's guilt? Um, like, there's a whole bunch of there's a whole bunch of stuff that could have been done with what is, I think, a very interesting setup for a character that just none of it connects with the person who is on the page, um, which is just strange and yeah. a missed opportunity. Yeah, the, because like the best scene with June is the one is her flashback to when she gets the alert and just bolts. Um, and I would have liked to see how do you become the kind of kid who, you know, your grandfather texts you danger, 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 run. Um, mm-hmm. And, um, and you just, and you do, you like 
get out, you jump onto the fire escape and make a dash for the safe house, which you absolutely know where that is. Um, yeah. So, well, so now that you've convinced me this book is anti-Semitic, I will point out that the fact that their language, the way their language works doesn't work uh, from a, like, linguistic standpoint. You know, this is this oh, yeah. is very much that one really annoying Star Trek episode. This here's a ditty about Darmok and Jalad. They come from a culture that's a little bit odd. Their species was made up for a thought experiment. And in Cockney rhyming slang told Picard to get bent. Um, you cannot actually have a language that works entirely on this untranslatable because it works entirely on implication, metaphor, and tonality. Because at that point, then you just update your dictionaries. Um, yes, and but, also, you can't write a fucking dictionary program that solves that because you're a great hacker, not because you like, I mean, studied yeah, the language. Right, like, right, I mean, I guess you could do it <laughs> maybe with some sort of machine learn, you know, some sort of, like, super advanced machine learning, I guess. But, again, if you can do that, so could Based other people. Based on what? <laughs> like, these people are all over Corpus there. Corpus analysis? Um, everything, you know, there seems to be a lot of stuff. Um but no, and so now that I, now that I've been properly convinced, not only is this bad linguistics, but also it is definitely an old anti-Semitic trope that like the you know Hebrew is this bizarre quasi mystical secret language. Yep. So. <laughs> sure is. Um, <laughs> uh, all right. Oh well. <laughs> all right. We are we are calling out this book, which I would still like to stress, nonetheless, has some real good character dynamics. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely does. Absolutely does. And, you know, sufficiently charmed me to overlook a lot of stuff until Isaac uh, successfully uh, made me be honest about it. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you for thank you for taking it in, in good in good stride and being good natured about it, which I often fail to do. I, I mean, it was a very well presented argument. <laughs> um, <laughs> and honestly, I mean, you know, both of us have a tendency sometimes to get sufficiently charmed by a book that like pushes the right buttons for us that we overlook a lot of problems um so it's true and like you know some of this was already kind of eating at the edges of my brain so uh it would have been dishonest for me to to push back against it <laughs> as we 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 part friends as we met friends and that's <laughs> the important thing but again nonetheless like if you don't mind a book that's deeply frustrating the fun parts are really fun they really are. Yeah. No, I think I, again, I would not have, you know, I found the last like 10th of this book excruciating, Yeah, <laughs> but like I, I had a lot of fun up and up until that point. Yeah. I, I honestly, I mean, even before I was looking for problematic elements, I found the last 10th of the book just not particularly well written either. Everything, yeah. for one thing, everything suddenly stops being hard for no reason. It feels really cheaty. I mean, you can't, and a lot of that is just pick, you know, making up the world's most virtuous people in your head and yeah. putting them in a in a book that had a bunch of real politic in it before that. Yeah. So. Um, all right. <laughs> all right. Uh, so the next episode that we're going to be recording, although I don't know what order these are going to come out, is uh, the Saint of Bright Doors, which is a um, excellent book, it is an and excellent I look forward book. to I look forward to discussing it a lot. I think I'm going to reread it before we uh, before we discuss it. Yes, as will I. And. Uh, and so until then, um, thanks guys. Yeah. Thank you. I've, Wizless has been a lot of fun recently. Absolutely. I'm you guys are also enjoying it. <laughs> All right. Bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>